Welcome back. Today we are going to discuss some of the important mathematical tools of theory of probability that we are going to use in our reliability based structural design. Today we are going to discuss moment generating function and central limit theorem. However, in this module uh, we are going to discuss all these topics. We will start with moment generating function, then we will go to central limit theorem, then we will discuss theory of estimation, there we will talk about point estimates and interval estimates and within point estimate we will discuss method of moments and method of maximum likelihood. And finally, we will go to the goodness of fit where we will discuss chi-square test and case test. So, let us start with moment generating function. If you recall, we have already defined random variable and its moments. So, if you recall, nth moment of a random variable x is defined by this expectation operator, which is a integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, because that is the range of this random variable whose PDF is defined by f x of x. So, the nth moment goes like this x to the power n product f x of x and integrated over the complete range of this random variable. Now, as we keep on changing n from 1, 2, 3 and on, we get actually different moments. So, if we put n equal to 1, we get first moment. Similarly, if we put n equal to 2, we get second moment. Now, these moments are useful for uh, uncertainty quantification. We have already studied variance algebra and there we have seen that how these moments are useful to quantify the uncertainty associated with the functions normally we encounter in our design, for example, a limit state. Now, when we estimate these moments, we need to integrate the functions over the complete domain and for every moment we wish to find out, we need to perform this integral. Now, that motivates us to actually find out is there any alternate route for finding these moments. And with that in view, we define what we call moment generating function of a random variable x and as per definition, capital M x of s is nothing but expectation of exponential s x. Please pay attention, the moment generating function is normally defined as the capital M, the subscript defines the random variable and as per definition it is nothing but expected value of exponential s x. Now, the function may be discrete or continuous. If the function is discrete, obviously expectation of e to the power s x is represented by a summation. So, the here the function is e to the power s x i because it is a discrete random variable. So, we have x i times the probability mass function of the variable x i that is p of x i. If we sum it up uh, for all i, we basically get the expected value of e to the power s x. Similarly, if we have a continuous random variable, then in that case our function is e to the power s x and therefore, the moment of this function is e to the power s x times f of x that is the pdf of x and integrated over minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, if you recall exponential of s x can be represented by a infinite series. You can see on your screen. So, it starts with 1, then s x, then s x square divided by 2 factorial plus s x cube by 3 factorial and it goes on. We have already studied variance algebra. So, if we apply the expectation operator on both sides of this function, on the left hand side we have exponential of e to the power s x and on the right hand side we have expectation of 1 is obviously 1, then expectation of s x is nothing but s times expectation of x and so on. Now, if we differentiate this function with respect to s, then what happens? The first differential gives us e of x. Similarly, if we differentiate twice, 
this function, we can get expectation of x square that is the second moment. Similarly, if we differentiate this function nth times and put s equal to 0, we basically get the nth order moment. This is very similar to Laplace transformation, but not exactly Laplace transformation. Now, with that, let us take some problem. So, we start with a random variable that follows binomial distribution. And for this distribution, we wish to find out first two moments. So, we know the description of binomial distribution on your screen. So, the PMF of this distribution is small p to the power x times 1 minus p to the power 1 minus x. Now, if we wish to find out the moment generating function, then as per definition, we have to find out the expected value of e to the power s x. Now, in this case, because this is a discrete random variable, so we have to multiply e to the power s x with p m f and sum for all possible values of x. Now, if you continue that, we basically get an infinite summation where we truncate the summation up to say n and we get this expression for the moment generating function. After simplification, we get the next expression and here you can see on your screen, we have n c x e to the power s times p whole to the power x times 1 minus p whole to the power n minus x. Now, to simplify this expression, let us assume a is equal to e to the power s and b equal to 1 minus p and with that, we can actually simplify this expression where it becomes n c x a to the power x b to the power n minus x and this we can actually further simplify as a plus b whole to the power n and then finally, we get this expression which is the moment generating function for binomial distribution. Now, again recall exponential of s x is a infinite series and then from there we are going to find out the moments. So, we need to differentiate this moment generating function once to get the first moment. So, we have done that and the expression we get on your screen and in this expression what we have to do to get the first moment we have to put s equal to 0. Similarly, we can also find out the second moment by differentiating this function twice and then put s equal to 0. So, if you do that for first moment, we get the expression n p which is again the mean and for the second moment, we get n p times n p plus q. So, these are the first two moments already known to us. So, the same we get from the moment generating function. If we continue with some more examples, so let us try with normal distribution having 0 mean and unit standard deviation. So, in this case, we know the shape of the normal distribution, it is a bell shaped curve because the mean is 0, we have the highest ordinate at 0 and then depending upon the standard deviation, we get different shapes of this normal distribution. In this case, we have 0 mean and unit standard deviation. So, the expression of the normal standard normal distribution you can see on your screen and the domain for this random variable is minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, in this case, if we find out the moment generating function, again we follow the same steps, but in this case, we have a continuous function and therefore, we have to integrate over the complete domain. So, we follow the same procedure our function is e to the power s x and we find the expectation of that function. So, e to the power s x times the underlying p d f and in this case, it is standard normal. Again, with some simplification, we get this expression and then further, we can simplify and then ultimately, we get this expression on your screen. So, the integral becomes 1 and then effectively we are left with e to the power a square by 2. So, that is the moment generating function. So, we have got the moment generating function for standard normal. So, 
our next step is to find out the first two moments. So, we expand this moment generating function which is e to the power s square by 2. So, if you recall e to the power u we can write down in terms of infinite series. So, it will be 1 plus u plus u square by 2 factorial plus u cube by 3 factorial and so on. So, following that same description if we expand this series we get 1 plus s square by 2 plus s to the power 4 by 2 square into 2 factorial and so on. So, we have the moment generating function in terms of infinite series. Our next task is to differentiate this moment generating function up to the order of moment that we are looking at. So, if we wish to find out rth moment then we have to differentiate this function rth times and then put s equal to 0. So, our first moment will be for r equal to 1. So, r equal to 1 if you put obviously, you can easily show that first moment in this case will be 0 and that is from where we have started because this is a standard normal the first moment is always 0. If we put r equal to 2 our second moment is 1 which is also consistent with the definition from where we started. Then if we put r equal to 3 we get again the moment is 0 and then r equal to 4 we get the value of the moment is 3. Now, in this case we have a standard normal distribution. So, all odd moments are 0 in this case and that is what we get from the moment generating function. So, if we continue next we consider exponential distribution. So, for that again the distribution is known to us. So, the expression is lambda e to the power minus lambda x for all x greater than equal to 0. Now, in this case the moment generating function again will be e to the power s x times this p d f and integrated over the domain in this case the domain is 0 to infinity. Now, again if we perform this integral it is very simple we can get this expression and then we have to evaluate this expression just by putting the limits of the integral and in this case we get lambda by lambda minus s as the moment generating function. We can simplify it further as 1 minus s by lambda to the power minus 1 because in this case we can actually expand it in terms of infinite series and then our moment generating function for the exponential case will be 1 plus s by lambda plus s square by lambda square and so on. So, either way we can express the moment generating function and then our next task is again to differentiate the function up to the order we are looking at and then put s equal to 0 to estimate the moments. So, if we find out the first moment obviously, we differentiate once and then put s equal to 0 and that mathematical operation leads to exponential of x is 1 by uh, lambda. Similarly, if we put r equal to 2 we get e of x square that is second moment. So, in this case we differentiate the function twice and then put s equal to 0 and if we do that we get second moment as 2 by lambda square. Now, from these two we can find out the standard deviation just to verify our derivation is correct because we have already discussed the mean and standard deviation for exponential distribution in our previous lecture. So, in this case also we get sigma square is ultimately it is 1 by lambda square and therefore, sigma is 1 by lambda again. So, for exponential distribution mean and standard deviation both are 1 by lambda. So, the results are consistent. So, we can use moment generating function to evaluate the moments. Next is again another example on Poisson distribution. So, in this case we have a discrete distribution. So, it is defined by probability mass function that you can see on your screen. The expression is lambda to the power x by x factorial times e to the power minus lambda. Now, in this case again our moment generating function will be expectation of e to the power s x which is because this is a discrete function we have to multiply e to the power s x with p m f and sum it up for all possible values of x and then ultimately we get this 
summation. Now, in this case, again we can further simplify and that is what we have done. e to the power minus lambda is constant. It is not affected by this summation. We take it out. And then if you recall, we have already discussed the expression of e to the power u, which is a can be expressed as an infinite series and it also converges. right? So, in that case, we can further simplify this expression as e to the power minus lambda times e to the power lambda e to the power s. So, that is the expression for moment generating function of a Poisson distribution. So, now if we find out then the moment we have to differentiate this function and put s equal to 0. So, the first moment will be first differential of this mgf where we put s equal to 0 and if we perform that exercise we get first moment as lambda. Similarly, if we find out second moment which is the second differential of the mgf and then finally put s equal to 0 which ultimately leads to lambda square plus lambda. And then in this case solution is converging and we get, but that is not always the case. We have to keep that in mind. And in this case also because we know the first two moments, we can also find out the second say central moment that is variance or standard deviation using these two values. So, if we continue our discussion and next example we take gamma function. So, the gamma distribution it is a continuous function and the expression is on your screen. So, for the moment generating function of this random variable again we follow the same step and then we get this expression where e to the power s x is multiplied by the gamma distribution and integrated over the domain in this case again the domain is 0 to infinite. So, then again we simplify this expression and we use the standard results and integration from 0 to infinity of this expression which is ultimately equal to 1. So, we use this result for all a and b greater than 0 into the original expression and then we get the moment generating function for the gamma function which you can see on your screen. Now, from this expression again we have to differentiate the expression up to the order and then put s equal to 0. So, for the first moment we differentiate this function and then put s equal to 0 which ultimately gives us the first moment is alpha by lambda. And similarly, we can also find out the second moment for this gamma distribution and which is alpha times 1 plus alpha divided by lambda square. So, these are the first two moments for gamma distribution. Now, let us consider a different distribution which is actually defined by this p x of x and x takes discrete values. So, in this case the moment generating function will be again because this is a discrete function we have to sum it up for all possible x and we basically get an infinite series where the pdf sorry pmf multiplied by e to the power s x summed over the complete domain gives us the moment generating function. So, in this case we have we further simplify this expression we get this nice expression. However, in this case because e to the power s x by a square where x ranges from 1 to infinity this is not a convergent series. As I told you earlier not always we get a convergent series. So, in this case moment generating function for this variable does not exist. So, these are some of the standard random variables and their moment generating functions. So, we have derived uh, the moment generating function for standard normal distribution, but here on your screen you have normal distribution. So, take this as a home task and just try this for a normal distribution having mean mu and standard deviation sigma. As a special case you can check for a standard normal distribution where mean is 0 and standard deviation is 1. Again in this case if you put those values you will get the moment generating function is e to the power s square by 2. So, this I suggest you please uh, derive as a home task. Now, before we close our discussion on uh, moment generating function, let us study the properties of moment generating function. This is important. So, m x that is the moment generating function where s equal to 0 is always 1. Then if we have two random variable x and y and if their moment generating functions are equal, obviously that implies that x equal to y. This is also logically true because both of them 
are giving us the same moment generating function and that in turn gives us same moments obviously the underlying random variable have to be same. Now, if we scale up a random variable by a scalar factor say alpha and then if we take the moment generating function of alpha x then it is same as we have the expression of moment generating function of x where we actually put alpha times s. So, the same expression we can actually get we already have m x of s in that expression if you put alpha s we get basically the moment generating function for a random variable which is scaled up by a factor alpha. Now, the next property which is very important if you have two random variable and if you sum them up. So, in this case we have x and we have y and if you sum them up. So, you have a new random variable which is x plus y and if we wish to find out the moment generating function for this new random variable x plus y it will be nothing but the product of the two individual moment generating function. We can easily prove this, but this is a very important property. So, if you have a sum of random variables and then moment generating function will be the product of individual random variables. Then the fifth property extremely important if we shift the origin of a random variable by an amount say a and then scale it by a factor b then its moment generating function is given by this expression. So, it will be e to the power minus s a by b times moment generating function of x where we put s by b. So, these two we can prove all this we are not going to prove all these properties, but again last two properties are very important we will use in our subsequent lecture. Now, if we put in place of s if we put i omega we get what we call characteristic function instead of moment generating function and this is also very similar to Fourier transform. Now, with that our discussion on moment generating function closes here. So, we move over to a very important mathematical model that is called central limit theorem. So, what is the definition of central limit theorem? So, if you have x 1, x 2 up to x n which are independent and identically distributed random variables with samples taken from the population either finite or infinite. Let me give you an example. In structural engineering we say use concrete as our material. So, we know uh, the strength of concrete follows normal distribution for the time being let us assume that it has a population mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Now, we design this material and then during construction we prepare this material we cast this material and then make some concrete blocks and then test it in the laboratory to find out the compressive strength. So, in reality we deal with a normal distribution that our material strength follows and the domain of the normal distribution is from minus infinity to plus infinity. However, in reality when we go to the construction field we actually take some samples we cast the material and then we take some samples and then we test the, uh, the samples in the laboratory to find out to ensure whether we have achieved the design strength or not. Obviously, because of various factors we do not get exactly the design value, but we have uncertainty there. So, we get different values and these are basically the samples from the population. Now, if we go back to the same example again what we have from the construction field is basically sample. So, every sample we test in the laboratory then we have an ensemble of some values which are again independent of each other one does not affect other and then they come from the same population and hence they are identically distributed. However, in this case we do not know exactly what is the population mean and variance that is what is mu and sigma that we try to estimate from these samples that we collect from the field. Now, the central limit theorem states that if we consider the mean of this the sample mean it actually follows a normal distribution with population mean and standard deviation sigma by square root of n. Again I repeat this x bar is the sample mean obtained from the sample taken from the population in this case it is x 1, x 2, x 3 up to x n. 
So, if we calculate the sample mean and if we change the sample size, obviously, we will get different values. So, this x bar follows normal distribution with mu that is the population mean as its mean and the standard deviation sigma by square root of n. Then if we define as new random variable z which is defined as t minus mu z by sigma z obviously, we have to define mu z sigma z that we will do in a minute. But for the time being we have a new random variable t which is the summation of all this iid sample. So, it is x 1 plus x 2 plus up to x n. So, t is the summation of all these values and then we subtract the mean that means, t minus mu z will have 0 mean and then we have standard deviation. So, in this case t follows normal distribution with n mu. The reason is n mu because x bar is nothing but summation of all these random variables divided by n obviously, t which is just the summation will have n times mu and then its variance will be square root of n times sigma. And if this is the case, then as n tends to infinity, pdf of z follows standard normal distribution. So, that is the claim made by this central limit theorem. So, we are going to prove this. For that, the theorem goes like this. If you have x n, a random variable whose moment generating function obviously, it will be capital M x n of s and x is the random variable whose moment generating function is m x of s. Then as limit n tends to infinity, m of x n s that is the moment generating function of x n will be equal to the moment generating function of x. In other words, as n tends to infinity, the c d f by this random variable x n will actually be same as the c d f of x. Just recall the moment generating function of standard normal distribution, we have already derived that it is nothing but e to the power a square by 2. So, if we try to prove that as n tends to infinity, p d f of z will follow standard normal distribution and therefore, what we can expect the moment generating function for this case will be nothing but e to the power a square by 2. So, let us prove this. So, what we have m z of s z is defined by uh, the expression t minus mu z by sigma z. Obviously, in this case m z of s will be m of t minus n mu by sigma to multiplied by square root of n times s. So, if we follow the definition of moment generating function, it will be nothing but expectation of this function and then obviously, if that is the case, recall we have already defined the property of the moment generating function. If we shift the scale if shift the origin and then change the scale, then uh, we get this expression for the moment generating function. So, that we apply now here. So, we basically get e to the power minus of this expression times m of t. So, the moment generating function of t where we put s by sigma times square root of n. So, again we know in this case t is the summation of n random variables. So, if we wish to define the moment generating function of t, we can do that from the moment generating function of individual x 1, x 2 and x up to x n. Now, we have already defined that sum of the moment generating function is equal to the product of the individual moment generating function. So, we will use that property and we basically get the last expression on your screen that is moment generating function for t we can express that from the moment generating function of x. Now, obviously, we have these two expressions and then if we put back this moment generating function for t in the original expression, we basically get moment generating function for z which comes out in terms of moment generating function of x. Obviously, because there is a summation, we have the product which ultimately gives this expression. Now, we can take the logarithm of this function that will simplify your calculations. So, you can see logarithm of m z of s is this nice expression, this power will come down. So, we have this nice expression as the moment generating function. 
So, in this case logarithm simplifies the problem, if we, we can operate in this original expression also, but then in that case we have to deal with a complex expression. Now, we also recall the expression for moment generating function, it is exponential of e to the power s x and we have this expression and then we also know logarithm of 1 plus y, we can write down the infinite series. So, we can see here, we will write down that expression to expand this in terms of infinite series in a minute and we also know the definition of the first two moments in terms of mean and standard deviation. So, let us use this expression for ln of 1 plus y in the original expression and then we expand and finally, we get this expression which looks a little complex, but if you follow the definition, you can easily derive these expressions. It is not a difficult task. And then what we do? We use the definition of ln 1 plus y as infinite series and then we expand this series and then retain up to first three terms just to show you the expressions because we for the timing we do not need higher order terms because we will focus only on the first moments or first two moments. So, further simplification gives you this expression, very nice expression and then in this case I just skip the intermediate steps, but those are very simple to follow, but it actually comes from the definition of expectation of e to the power s x and then the expression for ln 1 plus y which is an infinite series. Then if we continue our calculations, so we have ln of m z of s is this nice expression. So, now what we do as n tends to infinity, we find out what is the expression for ln m z and in that case we can easily show that because n tends to infinity all other terms will actually vanish and it will lead to a square by 2. Now, if that is the case, if n tends to infinity obviously m z of s will be e to the power a square by 2. Now, we have already derived this expression, if the moment generating function is e to the power a square by 2, obviously the random variable underlying random variable is normal with 0 mean and unit standard deviation. So, that proves as n tends to infinity in limiting sense, f z of z is normal with 0 mean and unit standard deviation. So, that is the proof for central limit theorem. Now, if we take an example in this case, we have x as a random variable with population mean and standard deviation are given in this case 10 and 4. Find out the probability that mean of 100 sample is less than 9 and also find the probability that sum of these samples is less than 900. So, in this case, we again start with the descriptions given, we have mean as 10, standard deviation 4. So, probability that sample mean is less than 9, we can easily figure out. So, we define the new random variable z. So, it will be 9 minus mu by sigma divided by square root of n and we simplify that the z has to be less than 0.25. So, in this case it is the probability of getting x bar less than 9 is 0 0.0062. So, we apply central limit theorem for this case. Similarly, if we find out the summation that is defined by t, we know t will follow normal with mean n mu and standard deviation square root of n times sigma. So, again we put the values and then we basically get again t will be less than point minus 2.5 which is giving a probability of again 0 0.0062. So, let us move further. In summary what we get if we have x1, x2, xn are the IID samples taken from a population having true mean and variance as mu and sigma square. Then the sample mean that is x bar follows normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma by square root of n. And then we can also define a new random variable z which is nothing but t minus mu z by sigma z where t is equal to the summation of all these samples. Then as limit n tends to infinity f z of z is equal to normal with 0 mean and unit standard deviation. So, let us quickly verify that. So, we start with a normal distribution 
and then from that we actually draw samples. So, we start with a very small number and then we keep on increasing the samples and then for every samples as we keep on increase the sample size, we find out basically the mean and the standard deviation. So, every case we plot the mean and we can see at the initial stage where the samples are less, obviously we have a fluctuation in mean and as we progress, as we increase the sample size, it actually falls with the population mean. Similarly, for small sample size, we have the standard deviations of the sample varies initially and then gradually it goes to the theoretical standard deviation. So, these two results from the simulation clearly shows the derivation that we have done for central limit theorem. So, with that let us close our discussion here. In the next class, we will discuss some other mathematical tools that we will be using in our reliability based structural design. Thank you very much. Thank you.